Great. Uh, so thank you again for the invitation. Uh, Wang Jing um, approached me to focus on the Trans Aging and Care Project, which was a collaboration between Swansea University and the University of Bristol um, and hosted and based at Swansea University in South Wales. So in this project, we want to explore what later life looked like for trans adults in mid to later life, so 50 years of age are and over and to identify what the health and social care needs might be for trans people in later life or um, planning for later life, uh, particularly specific to Wales. It was funded by the Dunhill Medical Trust. Um, we're very grateful for their support and funding for this particular project. Um, and you can see the research team. And I just want to acknowledge my um, fabulous co-investigators, Michelle Raveby, Christine Dobbs um, and Deb Morgan and Jenny Ann Bishop, um, who represents a trans community group um, called Unique, based in North Wales, um, collaborated with us on this study. And I'll talk more about some of the co-produced elements of this study as we go along. OK, so first of all, a little bit of background context. What do we know about the lives of trans people? We can see that there's increasing visibility about trans and gender diverse people in the UK. We can see that through policy and popular media. Um, so Barclay mentioned before uh, some of the uh, work of Caitlin Jenner and her appearance in popular media. So we have increasing visibility, but we also have in parallel increases in reported hate crime. And I've just included a, a statistic there from the Home Office about a 32% increase um, in England and Wales of reported hate crime between 2016-17 and 18-19. So this is reported hate crime by uh, trans people who are victims of those crimes. We're fortunate in the UK, we have this incredible um, survey study, the UK Government National LGBT Study, which was conducted uh, about three years ago now, um, reported in 2018. And it had over 108,000 uh, responses. Um, so an incredible amount of responses, an incredible um, data set. And 13% of those people, those respondents identify as trans. So it's very rich for us in getting a deeper understanding of what life is like currently for trans people in the UK. Trans respondents in this survey had lower life satisfaction scores than cis, lesbian, gay, bisexual people um, and the general population. So that was a key finding. 20% of those trans, 21% of those trans respondents state that their healthcare needs were ignored or not being taken into account. And this included difficulties accessing gender identity services, which we also found in our project as a finding as well. But unfortunately, this amazing survey had a very small number of people who were over 55 years of age, only 6% of respondents. And I think when it was executed, there wasn't um, much concerted effort about reaching out into care settings, for example, to increase numbers of respondents. So the, miss that the voices of older LGBT people in general are missing from that data set or limited in that data set. So what about older trans people's lives? We have limited research about older trans adults' lives and their health and social care needs in later life. Often research outcomes and findings that are specific to trans adults are, are hidden within LGBT samples um, or they're not reported. So a lot of research papers in this area are guilty of talking about LGBT groups in the title and in the abstract. When you get to the findings, there's often very, um, very little that's specific to trans people or that delineates what some of the unique findings might be for trans people. And Neil and others have recently um, uh, reflected this message in their review of UK Literature 2 on health inequalities. And they argue that trans people are missing lives within this body of work. So it's an important gap we need to address. And Michael Toes, um, who's a scholar in this area, has also talked about how this absence of trans lives is, is evident in literature on social gerontology, on ageing and on gender relations more broadly. 
these are some of the key theoretical ideas um, underpinning our study and that we were interested in. Um, the first point there is really asking us to think about the ways in which the assumptions we hold about sexuality and gender identity um, don't really mar up with the reality of trans lives and identities and often trans lives and identities disrupt the ideas that we um, that we can commonly hold about what normal and natural sexual and gender relations look like. So we are very much um, as a society invested in gender as binary, as oppositional between men and women. And from that, we have a whole heap of assumptions about what natural um, and normal relationships look like. And that mold doesn't work for a lot of LGBT people's relationships. And it certainly doesn't work for a lot of trans people's lives and relationships. Um, and there's some other interesting concepts there that I'll come back to. Um, I wanted to just bring attention to the notion of trans time that Judith, Hal Judith uh, Halberstam and uh, Jack Halberstam, I should say, excuse me, misgendering, uh, just misgendering him there, um, and, and Pierce have spoken about. So the notice of trans time is linked to different milestones that trans people experience across their life course. So there might be pivotal points in their life that or, or turning points that mark um, kind of new decades or new eras for trans people. It might be associated with receiving gender affirming treatments and might be associated associated with the commencement of hormone treatment or the access to a gender identity clinic. But they don't necessarily um, follow what we might associate with more conventional chronological milestones associated with straight or heterosexual um, lives and life courses. And I'll talk more a little bit about that when I come to the findings and I've got some examples of what that looks like in our data. Just a little bit of background about the Welsh context. This was a Welsh study um, and there's been a lot of change in how um, healthcare provision looks like for trans people in Wales. So when we finished the project, um, thankfully, fortunately, Wales had, its, had established its own gender identity pathway and a new Welsh gender team. This is the first time that Wales has had that. Um, a lot of trans, well, not a lot of, all trans people need a diagnosis of gender dysphoria to be able to access gender affirming treatments. And that diagnosis remains the key to accessing gender identity clinics. And there's been a lot of debate recently, um, politically in the public spheres about the need to reform that um, and to move away from that re medical requirement of diagnosis and assessment. Um, and I just wanted to make the point that transitioning means different things to different individuals. So people may seek to transition socially in terms of how they identify and present and express their gender. Other people might want to transition both socially and medically through accessing gender affirming surgery, but not everybody wants to necessarily pursue medical transition or access medical services in that way. When we were doing the study, when we were doing our field work, um, Wales still had the uh, previous adult gender identity pathway or CP21 as it's known in our policy. It was a very unique pathway, very different from England and Scotland um, and other parts of the UK. The first step was to consult a GP and request a referral to local mental health services. So assessment had to be done locally by mental health services. Um, and then they made a serve, and then a gatekeeper within that service made a decision about whether that person could be then referred to a gender identity clinic in London. Incredibly costly um, for trans citizens in Wales to have to access a clinic in London. Um, and we've encountered that in our findings as well, lots of practical problems, as well as the emotional uh, burden of, of having to access those services in a different nation. There are lots of co-produced elements to this study. Whether I can say hands on, hands on heart, it is a co-produced study in its entirety, I'm still, I still debate about that, but there were certainly lots of co-produced elements from the beginning and it was built into the design of our study. So from the very beginning, in terms of drafting the research proposal and mapping out what the study would look like, um, this was 
done with community members, with Jenny Ann Bishop from Unique and with input from some other trans community members who were working with Age Cymru at the time. Throughout the project, we had the advice and input and support of a critical reference group um, that was 10 individuals, 50% of that group were trans community members and that was a requirement of the group's terms of reference. So we made sure that we had that expert by ex expertise by experience through that channel. We also recruited, trained and supported peer interviewers to help us undertake the field work. And these were, um, again, trans community members um, who uh, wanted to be part of the research um, and make a difference um, through being part of the research and also gain those research skills. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. We employed a trans identifying counsellor and therapist to work with and support the peer interviewers and also to provide additional support for our participants. So making sure that we had provisions in place for people to access safe services, affirming services um, that were going to meet their needs. Um, and finally, we co-produced four digital stories with um, fantastic trans filmmakers in Brighton. Uh, Fox and Al from My Generation, who produced um, some fantastic outputs for Channel 4, amongst other um, companies. Um, and whenever we presented the findings to key stakeholders, um, we tried as much as possible to do that um, with mostly Jenny Ann Bishop so that we do it together as a collaborative effort. So there were lots of co-produced elements um, from beginning to end. These were the objectives of the study. Um, you can see the three objectives down the left hand side there um, and then our methods on the right hand column. So we had two part interviews with trans community members who were 50 years and over. Um, we had a survey, an online survey to gather the attitudes and views of health and social care professionals in Wales towards older trans people. And that survey incorporated three uh, validated measures that's been used in other research. And then in the last six months of the study, we had three workshops across different parts of Wales uh, where we brought together trans community members and health and social care professionals um, to talk through what are the implications of the findings and what needs to change in practice and policy in Wales. I mentioned the interviewer, um, the peer interviewers previously that we recruited and supported to be part of this research. So all of our interviews with trans participants, these are people who are 50 years and over, 22 in total. All of these interviews were conducted with a research officer leading the field work and with a peer interviewer. And so we have employed this trialogue model where we have the research officer as a trans ally, the peer interviewer and the interviewee, the community member being interviewed. We did this for a number of reasons to help us um, kind of address and balance up um, the power imbalances between researchers and trans participants. To be able to uh, quickly build a rapport and shared understanding between members of the research team and the participant. And of course, keeping with the co-produced elements of the study, that was an important underpinning principle throughout. And you can see there on the right, a little bit of information about the uh, people taking part in the study. So we had four trans men, one person identifying as gender queer, two people identifying as cross dressers, um, and 15 people identifying as trans women or women. Um, I was going to flag up some of the findings, but I'm just conscious of time and I want to kind of focus more on some of the research, the, um, some of the challenges associated with the research. So I think what I will do is just, um, I think I'll pass this on to Anne-Marie and Wenjing to circulate after this and let people have a look at these uh, key findings themselves in their own time. I'll just flag up some of the findings that were specific to trans people. A lot of the trans people in our interviews talked about not feeling equipped to come out as trans at earlier points in their life. 
often not having the vocabulary or the language to describe it. So a big vacuum of information about trans lives and identities prior to the arrival of the internet in the 1990s. So that's a really pivotal change in being able to not only connect with virtual communities, which have shared identities, but also access information about um, this word trans and to start to engage with what this might mean and what services might be available. A lot of our interviewees talked about critical turning points that they experienced, usually around midlife. And these were around um, changes in relationships. So um, some of our participants being married. So divorce and separation was a critical turning point. Children leaving home and becoming independent. Um, it might have been the loss of a family member, but there were points in midlife where our participants paused to reflect and thought, now is my time to start to take forward this transition. So a lot of the people taking part in this research were transitioning in mid to later life. For some people, later life brought new beginnings. And this is where I return to that idea about trans time. So for a lot of our um, participants, it was an exciting time as they were going through their, tra their medical transition and they were accessing uh, gender affirming surgeries and treatments. But they, they were able to become themselves, to use some of their language um, and to live their life how they wanted to live for a long time, um, both visible and out um, as trans people or how, however they um, identify their gender. But for others, there was a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity about their journey through um, medical support and through gender identity services. A lot of delays, um, a lot of cancellations of appointments and obstacles in encountered from various healthcare professionals involved in their care. And so for some people, later life had a sense of running out of time. And some of our participants talked about being in their 60s and 70s and feeling like they weren't moving forward and um, they were losing time to become themselves and complete that journey. Lots of social care worries as well about accessing social care services um, when reflecting on when this might, if this might be needed in later life um, with emerging care and support needs. So one concern was about um, having de experiencing declines in mental capacity, often associated with dementia, and uh, concerns about losing control over everyday decision making. So having others such as care staff, for example, making decisions about how I dress that day, what clothes I wear, um, how I present in terms of my gender identity. And um, uh, more volatile concerns about transphobic treatment in care homes and services from staff and other residents. I just want to share with you Barbara's quote there, and this captures that um, reflection about running out of time. And she's talking here about um, at age 69, she's concerned about the aging process, that she's running out of time um, and she'll probably be 70 by the time she finishes this process. Sophie is talking about the first time she went to a GP clinic, a local GP clinic, and trying to start a conversation about her feelings about wanting to be a woman and how she might start that journey. I'll let you read that. And you can see it's not a positive response or a firm response from the GP. And a lot of our um, interview participants had similar experiences where GPs were very reluctant to help, often because they just didn't have the knowledge and often trans patients were the educators. They had to go away and find the information about what services were available, what the referral pathways were, what treatments they could access, including hormones, um, and bring that back to the GP to help um, move that, uh, move forward through that journey. And Richard here is talking about some of the transphobia he experienced when he came back to his local surgery after receiving some surgery. So he'd been to London, had genital reconstruction surgery. Um, and this is the response he received from the nurse in his local surgery. And this was reflected in other participants as well, that sometimes healthcare professionals, particularly associated with surgery, local surgeries and primary services, um, 
convey this idea that trans um, citizens and patients were undeserving the NHS public support. And in some cases denied prescriptions or for us forced to pay for prescriptions by their GP, even though prescriptions are free in Wales. So just to finish, because I know I'm out of time, these are some of the challenges that we experienced and the ways in which we sought to address it. And some of these were foreseen, so we you know, we built in measures to address some of these, but then nonetheless they're still difficult experiences for everyone involved, not least the participants. So supporting trans participants with distress that's associated with difficult life experiences and post-interview support was critical, including having the um, the collaboration and support of our, of our trans identifying counsellor who was able to provide that support as well as our own immediate support as, as researchers. Privacy and confidentiality is paramount in this field um, as a lot of the people, not a lot, some of the people we spoke to as participants were not out, they were concerned um, about this becoming public knowledge um, or wider knowledge through their participation. So those ethical principles are even more critical in this context. All the challenges of capturing diversity um, and we struggled to, to capture the experiences of people over 76. Um, so it's kind of older, old people in that respect. Um, we, 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 we did manage to achieve that here and that was really difficult again because associated with issues about visibility and for a lot of trans people um, in later life um, they may not want to be known and recognized or identified as trans they might have completed that transition journey much earlier in their life um, and that's part of their life history but they don't want to necessarily um, be recognized as trans and it's no longer a kind of a kind of a key part of their day-to-day um, -day identity. Um, we were not as successful as recruiting as many trans people, uh, trans men, as we'd hoped to for this study. And this is also a reflection of broader issues about visibility and um, people having different um, requirements about how they want to be identified publicly and privately and um, whether they want to necessarily be involved or associated with a study that is focusing on trans lives and trans identities as that may no longer be significant or important to them in their day-to-day -day current life. And we had lots of obstacles of HR. Um, it was a nightmare and I think because a lot of our HR officers recruiting, supporting us with the recruitment of peer interviewers just didn't understand the importance of um, privacy and respect around identity checks. We know we've all probably had experiences with HR and trying to get people employed. We're having to do ID checks for um, visa purposes to make sure people um, can legally work in the country, all of those measures. Um, it, we had to educate human resources throughout the project. And if I was to do this project again, um, I actually would do the education of human resource people before we even started the project. Um, so I think that's critical for any department um, embarking on work in this area, just not to assume that human resources people are EDI equipped, because they won't, <laughs> but maybe they are now. Um, this is our website um, where you can um, see the, the films from my generation. Um, and see four digital stories. So four people who took part in the research and they share their story direct to camera. We've got practice guidelines for social work and healthcare professionals on there as well, because it was important that we translated these messages into messages for practice. Um, we've got lots of publications, both in open access journals um, and on um, some of our own university websites and the, and the funders website. So please have a look at that if you want to delve more into the findings and the research design. Thank you, Dil Kamba. Oh, lovely, but of Welsh. Um, That's about thank as you far very as much. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop sharing.